right, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Bill Wong, president of HCMS right now. <clears throat> and I uh, want to welcome you all for coming. This is actually a pretty good turnout. Um, normally don't see this many faces. Um, we counted the bentos. We are one short. So if you uh, better go get one. Okay. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the HSA payment transformation pilot. We have uh, two speakers, uh, Kevin Kurohara and Mike Nagoshi. And uh, I'll just let them come on up and uh, give you their experiences. And we will have um, time for questions and answers afterwards. That way we can get through the material and then we can fire away afterwards. Um, basically, uh, oh, parking. If you have parked in the structure and you don't have a card, Jessica has tickets to get you out of the parking lot so you don't have to rest in your car. And um, basically, I think it was uh, Albert Einstein said that doing something over and over again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. So uh, hopefully, uh, that's not the case this time. All right. First up, we'll have um, Mike Nagoshi. He is the <coughs> chief medical officer of Ikahi Health. And Ikahi is one of the four pilots in the current transformation paradigm. He will speak to his experience of this new model in their company. Thank you. Actually, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take as little time as I can to tell you about our pilot because we're only three months into it. And so the answer to most of the questions is I don't really know. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, Dr. Kurihara uh, has been into a program for the last three or three years, two or three years, and so he has a lot of experience to tell us about, and so I'm planning to spend 15 minutes at the most um, telling you about the pilot, and then I really want to turn the microphone over to Kevin. So um, everybody is going to be on this new payment model in 2017 next year, and some of us have been on a pilot since April 1st, so we're in our third month. And these are the four groups that have participated in that pilot. And we have been, um, because we're the pilot groups, we've been meeting with HMSA regularly to give them feedback. Um, and we know that HMSA has some University of Pennsylvania consultants that are helping them on this new model. Uh, and to, to date, I'll tell you that HMSA has been very um, forthcoming and very willing to uh, make fixes to, to problems that we've been encountering in the project. So we all know that the payment model drives the system change. So if we don't get paid correctly, we're never going to do something different. And we're never going to build anything unless we do something different. And we all know that fee-for-service is um, believed to be the root of all evil. And in fact, um, April 16, 2015 is believed to be the, um, the date that signals the death of fee-for-service. This is the date that President Obama signed the um, MACRA um, legislation that is essentially going to change the way each, uh, Medicare also pays us um, going forward. So there's, of course, some problems with FIFA service. And one of the main ones is that the FIFA service system uh, is driven by volume. So the more patients we see, the more we get paid. And if we don't see them, we don't get paid. And if we don't have a diagnosis, we can't always charge. And so we're sort of the hamster on the wheel, and we're just churning and churning, trying to make sure that we, our businesses stay alive. And the result of all of this, of course, is that we do a lot of acute care. There's not enough prevention and wellness. There's less time to spend with patients. There's lots of money spent on this volume, but not enough on doing the right thing. And so we have a lot of us who are feeling very burnt out all of, over all of this. And the worst part of it is that when we look at health outcomes, um, we haven't made any improvement. So the new payment model proposes that we would get paid a per member per month payment, which would stop that churning, get us off that wheel. And we get a lump sum for each payment, for each patient, regardless of the number or the type of visits. And it would include wellness, and would cover, we'll cover telephone calls, and would cover care that's not necessarily provided by us. You know, we only can bill for what we do, but um, under the new payment model, we're covered for things that, we're, uh, that our staff do. Patients can come in to check their blood pressure, and we get covered for that. So the new payment, this on, the, um, on this side is the current payment model. 
which is that we get fee for service payments, there's a PCMH care management fee, and then we get a bonus for P for Q. In the new payment model, what they've basically done is to, to take what we would normally have gotten paid in fee for service and PCMH together and created a per member per month on this side, which is supposed to be, at least in the first year, equivalent in amount. Although 20% of it has to be earned, 80% is guaranteed. And this engagement measures I'll talk about in a second. And then in addition, in the new payment model, there's a, there's a potential for us to share in total cost of care. So the PMPM is based on, in the first year, is based on our his, historical fee-for-service payments. So in essence, we're, they're trying to make us whole for what we would have normally gotten paid in a year. And so it includes everything except for vaccines, and they pay that monthly to us. But in future years, they intend to make this payment related to other measures, such as the engagement measures, quality measures, uh, panel risk adjustment, and total cost of care. So it won't simply be based on your fee-for-service payments. And what this would, is supposed to do is take us off the treadmill. It's supposed to create room to increase panels. And it should encourage us to create teams to help us take care of patients. This engagement measure is supposed to be easy to obtain because they really want to give us 100% of that fee-for-service equivalent. And so these are just things like using Coziva and making sure that patients feel like we've reached out to them once a year and referring to the uh, ecosystem programs. And these are things like um, diabetes education or kidney foundation education or Ornish um, uh, reversal programs. And these are scored annually and they're it causes a discount of the total pay per member per month in the following year. And so what this is supposed to do is incentivize physicians to participate in population health management. And then, um, of course, we have our quality metrics, which they've streamlined to some extent because it's one set of metrics now across all lines of business and is scored annually and it's paid quarterly. And, and there's a slightly different per member per month for the uh, quality metrics depending on what line of business. And this is supposed to, of course, pay us for encouraging wellness and prevention. And then there's the total cost of care, which is a little bit um, nebulous to us still in the pilot as to how this is going to get calculated. But it is the way that they're planning to calculate this is based on the physician organization performance. And it's not a, um, it's not a curve. So the best physician organization isn't going to get paid more than the worst physician organization. You're going to get, your organization is going to get paid on the basis of how well you did in comparison to your historical. So if you as a PO do better, even though you're the worst PO, you can get some um, shared savings um, bonus money. And, the, and, and this it's scored at the physician organization level so that no physician should have to feel like their total cost of care is what caused them to get paid more or less. So this takes us out of the, um, out of the scenario where we feel like we have to restrict our care to make more money. And it incentivizes basically providers to properly utilize healthcare resources. So our initial observations are that it feels like it could get us off that wheel. Whether it does or not is a different question, but it feels like it could. It de definitely feels like we can emphasize wellness and it rewards us for quality and it will encourage us to, to be more efficient. Of course, there's always a but. And the but is, is that in order to make this work in any practice, there's going to have to be some transformation that occurs. You've got to transform in order to be successful. And the reason for this is that this um, new payment model actually inverts the, the practice economy to some extent. So in fee-for-service, we're all about one patient at a time. We're about treating illness. We're about, about working on complications. But in payment transformation, we're really concentrating on keeping people well and preventing those complications and because and the revenue on the fee-for-service has always been more visits more revenue in 
payment transformation is going to be about more, more panel, more patients, more revenue. And whereas it was only our services that get paid for in FIFA service, in order for us to survive in payment transformation, we're going to need help. We're actually going to need to have a team helping us to take care of our panel of patients, keeping them well. And so expenses in a fee-for-service environment, and staff in a fee-for-service environment is really a major expense. And so all of us over the years have tried to have less staff so we can have less expense. That's the way the economy of fee-for-service works. But in payment transformation, the staff is our primary asset. Because if we have really good staff and d with different expertise, like, for example, a health coach or a care coordinator um, or a diabetic educator, it will allow us to increase our panel size because we get help in taking care of them. And physicians are provided an opportunity to focus on what matters, which is keeping people healthy. So <clears throat> it isn't all good. And so there have been some, I would say, sensitive points, and I thought I'd share some of them with you guys to give you a flavor for what you're hopefully not going to have to encounter in the way we did, because we've already made some improvements in some of these issues. So the first issue is the PMPM calculation. And I don't know if some of you in, your room, in the room, you might have gotten from HMSA through your physician organization an estimate of what your PMPM rate is going to be. Is, does anybody in the room had that experience? Okay. So the PMVM calculation is based on all of your previous FIFA service payments except for immunizations. And for you guys, it's going to be the period 2013 to 2015. For us, it was 2012 to 2014 because we started in this year. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. And it includes all of your fee-for-service payments, including secondary HMSA payments, which means that if you have patients with um, HMSA secondary, you're going to get PMPM for them, even though, even though HMSA is not your primary insurance. So for me, that's the EUTF, that's the state uh, retirees, and I have plenty of them. Um, you get paid for consultations, you get paid for anything, you, you, any charges, you, uh, any revenue you get from inpatient ENM coding, and you'll get, and you, it is, does include any payments you get, you have gotten because you covered for your partners, or you covered for anybody. So anything that HMSA actually gave you a 1099 for is covered under this calculation, except immunizations. Um, the interesting thing is that there is a several fold variation in the PMPM across physicians. Uh, a disturbing uh, difference between some physicians and others. And the reason for this um, is uh, we, we, the physicians in the pilot have all learned to hate it and like it at the same time. So it doesn't feel fair, but if you can imagine that if you are one of the people who were, had a high PMPM and you had to conform to the norm, which was a low PMPM, that your practice may be in financial trouble in the first year out of the gate. And their plan is in the first year to keep everybody whole. And so um, we all feel, I, at least I feel, that I don't think HMSA has any choice in that. It would, would have been fairer to me if I got some blended rate because I was one of the low PMPMs. On the other hand, some of my partners were on the high side, and what would happen to them if, if, the PM, if they, their PMPM got all of a sudden cut in the first year? So that's a problem that we have come to um, reconcile in our brain, I think. There hasn't been a lot of discussion about that. The other interesting thing about PMPM is that we, real, we several of us have calculated out based on our own um, financial records how accurate that PMPM is. And everybody who has done that in the pilot has realized that that calculation appears to be very, very close to what you would have gotten in the same period of time. Uh, the other issue with the PMPM is that there's no payment for covering physicians um, for covering physician visits. So if I go on vacation and somebody else sees my patient, they're not going to get paid for that because I'm getting paid for it. And of course, the, the plus side is when I go on vacation, I'm going to get a check from each and say whether I'm there in the office or not. Patient attribution is, is a major deal. 
um, because if you don't get attributed to patient, you don't get the PNPM. And so we, we've gone back and forth with HMSA over this, but basically what they've done is to create a hierarchy based on uh, whether the pa we can attest that we have an agreement with the patient that we're their primary care doc. Um, some of the, the HMSA plans, uh, the patient will um, designate a PCM PCP at the time of enrollment, uh, and otherwise you get assigned patients if you're the one that saw them the most frequently in the last 16 months. And then if, that, if there's a tie there, it's the PCP who's seen most recently. Um, and so there are lots of time is being spent by all of us trying to be sure that we have all of our patients uh, attributed to us. So this is one of the interesting, one of the interesting realities. Um, so this is the question we tossed around. In HMSA payment transformation, the, ph the physician will be paid the same whether they see each patient one time a year or five times a year. So true or false? Okay. So we realize that actually that's not exactly true. And so the reason why it's not exactly true is that act for the insurance portion, it's true. But remember that you have co-payments. And so if you have less visits, you have less co-payments. And remember that you're, you're gonna, you're part of your engagement money is whether the patients believe that you've made contact with them. And so you, you, you want to be sure that you have enough visits that patients think that you've made contact. And if you're one of those offices that use your office visits to get their quality numbers up, then if you see somebody once a year, you only have one chance to get the quality, get to the quality measures, whereas if you see them four times, you get four chances. So it could affect your P for Q monies as well. Total cost of care is kind of interesting because I guess if you see them less, um, you're going to reduce total cost of care. But your office visits has really a minimal effect on that total cost of care um, calculation. And then finally, there's a bunch of new adult measures that have created an increased administrative burden. And we're working um, very closely with HMSA to try to reduce that burden. And they have actually um, been very willing to help us out on that issue. So we're still working on the details of that, but there's lots of issues there that we're working through. And I'm going to save all the questions for the end, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Kevin. is the president of E-Hawaii IPA. E-Hawaii IPA has been a part of the HMSA pilot model office for the past three years. Are you guys the first? Are you guys the first? Well, yeah. It it was. Was. yeah. This is a global bundled payment model that is the precursor to the current transformation model, so it's slightly different. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. He will share the experience over the last three years and the feelings of their physicians uh, about this program. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, our IPA has uh, had some, a lot of changes going on. We got started way back when uh, HMSA, excuse me, when Queen's Medical Center had, I'm not sure if you guys have been around at that time, but had Project 2000, which at that time, they reached out to a lot of communities, um, physicians across the state, and tried to organize them for the first wave of capitation that came through at that time. So we started at that time. The organization came up very quickly as far as uh, the IPA. And um, after that first wave of capitation kind of died out, every, all the organizations kind of lay quiet for a while until um, PCMH came on board. And that put a lot more responsibility back into the organization so our organization all of a sudden had to ramp up but what um, and I've been in practice about 30 years we're all in solo practice in Hilo and um, <coughs> Uh, about four years ago, our community was fortunate to receive a grant from the federal government called the Beacon Grant. And that kind of started, actually, Mike Sayama with HMSC was very instrumental in having that grant be awarded to the Big Island. But it kind of started um, a project that we call the Model Office. Um, one of the goals of, of the Beacon Grant was to see if um, 
we could implement an alternative to the fee-for-service model. So at that time, um, we started a, a kind of a journey to see how we can change our practices to with, with the shifting tides. So um, that first model office um, group that we started with was um, about 10 physicians, but equal number of internists and family physicians, and we're all busy practices in Hilo, usually all full. But um, we started to meet, and we had some um, help from a group called uh, TransferMed, which is a subsidiary of the AAFP. And we had them come in and help our staff to try and change the way we do things so that uh, we would be ready for um, a change in the payment model. So that model office started there and, and um, initially, just like this project, we averaged three years of income. Uh, we took, it, it came down to a monthly payment, um, basically right across the board, nobody lost out. In fact, they said, you know, we'll guarantee you you get the same amount or more, you know, from the fee-for-service conversion to the um, global. So nobody really lost in that. And it's very similar to what you see now this year, and nobody's going to get less than they did before. They shouldn't because they're taking all your billings for the past three years and coming up with an average number and then paying you a monthly fee for that. So we started off that way, and... Um, we still had at that time the beginnings of the PCMH and the pay for quality program. So that was uh, on top of our monthly fee. Actually, our project to this date is strictly working with the commercial patients and not Quest or Medicare. Um, by the um, so the so after this monthly sum, they said, well, we'll change it to what they call a PMPM, which is um, per member per month. So they just took our attributed lives, the n number of patients assigned to us, and they just divided it up and came up with a number. And there was a lot of differences uh, between the different practices based on how we practice. That's how the whole state is right now. There's a lot of disparity in you know um, how physicians practice, how they get paid. Um, a couple of years ago, as we went through this process, we, you know, because of the differences, we had a goal of trying to see whether we can reduce that. So we did a lot of talking and negotiating. And, and so in 2014, we started to um, come up with an alternative. Uh, we met with Poshner a lot and um, uh, actually came up with a payment model for that, um, that went into effect last year, which actually started with a national number. Um, we used the MGMA um, average 50 percentile income for family physicians and internists. It came up actually with the same number. We decided that that instead of having one for internal medicine, one for family for practice, we came up with a number that was agreeable to both parties and the internists actually did agree to a, a decrease in their PMPM and from this point forward we have the same PMPM um, this past year. We added three more physicians. We offered it to whoever wanted to. There's a lot of hesitation. So um, right now we have 13 physicians on this model. Strictly commercial lives, no Quest or Medicare. And you know we've been doing that so far. Um, some of the goals that we had was to provide a, you know, specialty specific revenue stream that supports um, our practices and that would be nationally competitive. So one thing with our model, we took the MGMA 50 percentile and there is a calculation based on overhead expenses, uh, a lot of uh, other uh, factors in there, including risk, uh, risk adjustment. Um, and that risk adjustment right now plays a small part and that maybe that can be tweaked in the future, but a small small part in our adjustment and I think that will probably be an area of work and to help us you know with a different set of you know goals in terms of how we take care of our patients. Um, I'm taking some of these slides from uh, my colleague um, Linda Dolan who's our current medical director and transformation director and how her experience which is similar to all our offices but each one of our offices had to make changes to try and um, accommodate the new payment model. I think it overall came out for the better and, and we had chances along the way that our doctors had the opportunity to opt out and to the years um, none of nobody opt out and in fact uh, 
three more people joined. So it was taken well. And um, I would say, for the most part, um, our income or our revenues from this new payment model was at least the same and in most cases better, especially when you include the quality bonuses and stuff. And, and I believe that, you know, for primary care, at least they have to pay us more. I, if you want to get people that are interested in primary care, which is a, you know, a different set of work and a, a, a lot of extra things that we do, you have to incentivize the doctors and, and pay them for the work that we do. And, and up until this time, I, I know that your staff is filling out forms and answering calls and doing all this other stuff between the visits. And that's where we, I, we feel now that we're getting compensated for a lot of stuff that we weren't getting paid for before. And it doesn't mean that they have to come in to you know, talk to me face to face to answer a question. I, I don't, you know, um, things can be done by telephone, by email. We have secure email to our portals. And we try to find alternatives to take better care yet at the same time be accessible uh, for our patients. So it's been a journey and we're still learning. Uh, I think a large part of um, how we got started with this TransferMed group was um, um, it's, it's a national organization that came in and we started with simple things like um, having our staff talk to each other, we call them daily huddles. We talk about the patients for that day. Uh, we do pre-visit planning, which um, you know, weeks and ahead of the visit, we're looking at the patients that are coming in and seeing where their care gaps are and trying to take care of a lot of the things that can be done between the visit as much as possible. So when they come in, I don't have to spend my time worrying if they got a mammogram or a colonoscopy. I get to the root of the problem. I can spend my visit talking to them about what they there for and not for uh, health maintenance measures that um, should be taken care of you know ahead of time so there's a lot more I, I, interaction that I feel that I can spend more quality time with the patient I'm not worried about because um, my staff I they've really helped me a lot in taking care of these things ahead of time um, and they alert me for the things that I need to do if if several staff have talked to the patient and still don't want to you know engage in these quality measures then I'm the last straw, so I'm the one that says you gotta do this or you should do this. So it's kind of neat. We kind of work as a team, but um, so there's a lot more communication. The ideas of the transformation of our uh, in our office was to help each of the employees work at the highest level as they can, so that 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 the doctor can feel comfortable in delegating some of the responsibilities to the staff so that you don't have to be burdened with everything. So I kind of like now when I see the patient because I don't have to worry about all these things and it's a nice visit. I spend a longer time with the patients and because really our income is not based on a full schedule, um, uh, I can actually leave more time for the visit but I also block off two, three hours um, for what we call same day visits. So if somebody calls before and my schedule is already full in the fee for service arena and you're trying to squeeze more patients into an already full schedule, it's, it's crazy. You run behind, they wait a long time. So now you know, we're trying to strive for a wait time less, less than 15 minutes. Um, so I try to accommodate as many of the call-ins every day. We, we try to get all the people who want to be seen that day, seen that day because I blocked off time. And your income won't, won't suffer because of that you know, um, scheduling. And, and so you can get into it. So I spend a lot of time in my scheduled visits and they may not need to come in as often, you know, because we take care of a lot of these things uh, between visits and at the time. So it, it works out good. So some of it, the change was to for the doctors to buy into this change um, uh, and to relinquish some of control and the staff to be engaged working as a team. Um, it seems simple, but this huddle concept of just talking about your schedule before you begin, it, it helps, you know, because you can tell your staff, you know, I think this visit might be a little longer because there's some other the issues that came up and I'm aware of that so they can adjust the schedule make sure that uh, I don't run behind um, in, in terms of the money like like um, I was saying you know the revenues come in as a, a, a one check once a month um, which is for us to commercialize and then on top of that the bonus is a PCMH which is a monthly bonus and the P for quality is a quarterly bonus that comes in separately and for our model office too now um, our current payment um, is based on a national number so 
I think for us, uh, it feels comfortable because I've always under the impression that Hawaii gets the lowest paid or lower than the mainland. So this might be attractive if if the if this is something that the whole state adopts to recruit physicians because it's hard now to get doctors to come here. They're going to get paid a lot more, especially in primary care on the West Coast. Uh, they're offering salaries that we can compete with. Um, of course, we're in private practice in Hilo. We have a different challenge: how to get somebody from a residency program into private practice, which is very difficult. But we're trying different things as far as, far as community doctors to help them get started if they want to come back to Hilo. Um, so Linda's, you know, office. This is some of the things that they've been doing, uh, restructuring their day, um, the huddles, weekly protocols. Um, this is neat, you know, so the staff is taking a little bit more uh, responsibility in terms of how to handle different things. Um, um, the previous planning, I can't emphasize that enough because that for me, it takes a lot of worrying off my shoulders and when I see the patient, I, I, I enjoy it. Um, my biggest problem is I can't type too well and the EMR is still the biggest hurdle for me because I'm old fashioned and I'm not a techie person. But I try to, you know, I like to hands on touch, examine, talk face to face, and I try to work out all of that. So I end up staying later afterwards doing my charting and the same old thing, you know. I'm sure everybody's that challenge is always there. Um, I was talking to Sharon Lawler one day. I said, Sharon, how do you do this? And she's a busy gal. And so she said, uh, she tried everything and she went back to dictating. So that's what I'm doing now. I said, you know what? It's worth my time to get a transcriptionist. She can enter the stuff in the EMR. I don't have to worry about you know, my driving not working or coming up with words that I cannot read later on. So anyway, I kind of went back to that. And, and you know, income-wise, it you know, that little bit extra, to me, it saves me a lot. I'm not spending my whole weekend um, charting. At least I'm not behind this much as it was before. Um, so, you know, even some of the, what's, um, some of the previous planning includes a lot of the Medicare stuff too with the uh, annual well visits, um, with um, the, the, the complicated RCC gaps of care. So my staff kind of clue me into what things I have to make sure I got on my, you know, my diagnosis so I don't have to worry too much. So it's really good in that area. Um, some of the things that for Linda folks, you know, works well. And you know, this PDSA, I'm not sure, you know, if you're familiar with that concept. It's kind of new to me, but it's the Toyota principle. I, I'm not sure if you're of quality. Anyway, you you pick a, something that you want to improve on and you, you do a little, you, you come up with a hypothesis, you, you start doing it already, um, implement that, and then you come back and study it again and try and improve it. So continuous quality improvement, that same kind of thing. So um, we do that to try and improve flows in the office to see where we can improve on, what's the best efficient way that we can handle this. So there's a lot more interaction than it was before, where before nobody talked to each other, we kind of do their own thing, and there was very little staff-to-staff -staff interaction. So for us, it's been good. I mean, trying to perfect on things um, uh, as, as these quality measures change, how to do it again, so. Um, as far as benefits that we see, um, kind of like off the treadmill in terms of you know this fee for service, get the patient in, uh, generate the most income. Um, yeah, there is uh, that consequence that if you take time off, of course, you're still getting paid for that. In Hilo, that came up in one of our call groups um, as an issue, and we, we felt that between the call group coverage, I think if there is a feeling of inequity that you're not covering for me as much as I'm covering for you, then we feel that that doctor who's already getting paid, they should probably share or maybe pay the person if, if that's a bad feeling, that they should share some of their income that they're getting in any way when they're on vacation. So we kind of left it up to the call groups to work it out. But as an organization, we really haven't had any rules because it's really a doctor to doctor thing. But that came up as one of the issues because one guy takes off a whole lot more than the other guy. And, you know, this thing's like, oh, I got to cover for you again. So, um, time with patients, as I was saying, that we, you know, I feel like I'm not as stressed about my schedule being backed up by a work in that somebody put in because they're sick and they messed up my schedule. Once you put somebody in, your whole schedule can be messed up for the rest of the day. But we don't do that anymore. We have blocked off time for our work-ins. And you know, I don't have to stay as late as I did before and trying to catch up. Um, Team-based care, um, again, sharing the staff. 
they are happier and, and we you know, my personal thing is that if, if I get bonuses I'm going to sh share with the staff so they have incentivized bonuses so that they help out with this whole concept they're part of the team so our bonuses are based on how well we do as an office um, on the negative side yeah this is a big thing I think the, the more stuff we have to enter to the EMR to qualify us for these bonuses so I think there's a lot of improvement that has to be done with with, with uh, how we report these and if we can extract some of these bonuses through the electronic records it'll be easier for us if they can somehow if the insurers have a way of extracting that from the EMR then that'd be much better we don't have to spend time trying to input that into COSIVA uh, and extra work for our staff. Um, the differences in the global payment is that we practice differently and we need to work this out. Like I might do, I do a lot of, you know, joint injections, things, procedures. I, I still do a lot in my practice, derm stuff, you know, cryotherapy, and some may not. But all in all, you know, even if, you know, I do give shots and, and, and the catalog does cost, it, you know, it, it's still, I still work out better, much better under this new payment model than I was under the fee for service. I don't, you know, look at you know these things as much now because the payments are for me significantly higher. Um, I still have charts to do at the end of the day, and yeah, it's still we all practice differently. And for me, uh, it has been like Linda, kind of a definitely a positive experience. Um, as I was saying, capturing more data through the EMRs. Um, uh, care coordination is a whole other area. I was talking to uh, Kara about that. Um, how, you know, as a group of doctors, how can we do a better job of taking care of our patients? So as an organization, we've been uh, working on a, what we call the best heart care project, looking at CHF and trying to um, employ care coordinators, nurse RNs that go out to the community and help with transitions of care. So that's a project we've been working on uh, as an IPA. It does cost money because these are monies that normally we're not used to to paying for uh, someone going out into the home, record selling the meds, first po first uh, day home from the hospital, and making sure that they don't bounce back. So these are things that I think as an organization of doctors, if we then take on a little bit more of this payment pie, we can execute, I think, do a better job you know, of doing that. And I know we have, we're going to be working with um, this post concept, which is going to um, give us more help as we um, tackle these areas of transition of care. Um, in Hilo, we have an organization called Community First, which actually over the past year has been exciting because we have employers um, meeting with us, the doctors and the hospital, all the people who are part of the healthcare team. We're naturally uh, meeting on a regular basis to see how um, the community can take a little bit more responsibility on, on the care. So it's been exciting. We have what we call a regional uh, healthcare cooperative that's called RIC and that's patterned after um, organizations on the West Coast, including Oregon. And so we're trying to see if this entity could be a, a major part of how we do care in Hilo and then that entity may be reasonable to then also be somewhere in the picture as we have payment transformation and um, accountable care type organizations. And the final thing is you know, how to engage our patients more so that they take more responsibility for our care. So kind of in a nutshell, it's been a relative, you know, positive experience. Like I said, all in all, our doctors have been happy. Uh, they, none of them have gone back and they don't want to change back to the old way. In fact, they won't. Um, so in, in our negotiations for our contract, you know, we, we're going to be looking at some little bit further refinement of this payment model. And hopefully, I'm not sure if the state's going to be adopting what we started with, but it's, it's up to you guys. So, yes. Can you share with us what your PMPM is? Is that a big difference? Um, like, did you have a different model for the PMPM? Yeah, um, our PNPM is based on the MGMA, and uh, the yeah, twenty minus about twenty-three. And all the positions have the same PNPM. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, on top of that would be the PCMH until now, and then the quality. That's a different model than what is currently going to be well, they, they actually not that everyone in the state will not have the same PMPM. This year, every doctor will have a different PMPM based on their three year past billings. Yes? What's your impanelment? 
How many patients? Uh, my commercial panel is 1,800 around there. I have a big, big practice. Uh, I'm busy. <laughs> work long hours. Yeah. Um, for hearing purposes, you might want to repeat the question so that. Oh, yeah, okay. My panel size for my commercial is about yeah, 1,800. Yes. When you say commercial, are you talking about PPO and HMO? Yes. And are they treated the same because their premiums are not the same? Yeah, I mean, we don't. Nothing really is visible for the patient. Actually, they're unaware of what's been going on because their co-payment is the same. It's you know, they're not aware that we have been in this payment model actually. And how do you determine the co-payment? Is that nine nine? Um, um, the co-payment that hasn't changed at all. Yeah, so it's been the same determined determined by their plan. So the co-payment dictated by whatever plan they're in would determine their co-payment. So that comes in in addition to our global monthly payment. That means the biller, you still need a biller to bill every... Yeah, we still submit claims just like we did before because we have to analyze and compare fee-for-service versus the global. Of course, we're seeing the patients probably less often in most cases. Um, and yet, so the, if we actually were fee for service, we'd be paying much less than we get paid now under the global. Yes. Because a lot of work is done between the visits. I don't, you don't, they don't have to come in for things that used to bring patients in just to go over a lab result and stuff or, or something like that. If it needs discussion, we would do that. But many times, um, for you to spend time on telephone versus bringing them in, you know, it's your choice now whether you want to do that or take care of it in some other means, email, telephone. Um, if you want to bring them in every day, you can. Um, um, so it really varies by patient to patient and what the doctor feels comfortable with. But it, it won't be that you have to bring them in to, dis to get paid to discuss a problem or an issue. Yes? Well, I don't, I'm not shooting the messenger. I want you to realize that because uh, this whole concept I'm Dr. Ng. Yes. I'm going to represent some ideas that were shared with us by Dr. Stephen Campbell, who couldn't make it today. And there's a whole group of us that have been looking at this issue from the point of view of what the original premise was, was that doctors were doing too much for the, for the money. In other words, this was pretty much the administrative view that they're doing more work to get more money. So the biggest issue really comes up is how do you deal with one of the biggest problems I would see is what, how do you deal with the patient that's really more critical? You have a lot more risk in a patient who has multiple diseases that you're treating and yet theoretically if you're going to lose money in the so-called bonus at the end because you're having to take care of that patient more and the costs are going up, theoretically uh, that is going to be a dissuasion factor for you and, and you know people being human you think okay so I got to build a practice which has pretty low number of the, of the high risk number one number two you mentioned that you don't have Medicaid and you don't have Medicare in there so those are the financial risk patients also that are theoretically if you got involved with taking care of those kind of patients how would your how would your model actually work so let me just tell you what Stephen Kemble shared with us because he sent a letter to everyone that was on this discussion group and he's, he quoted two recent articles from the New England Journal, the two-year costs and quality in the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative. And basically, uh, after analyzing approximately 425 practices, they found at the end of two years, one, there was no cost savings, and two, there was no increase in the quality. So the whole thing, after two years, it's 425 practices that was analyzed for this article in New England Journal. Another article appeared the same, also in New England Journal, saying early performance of accountable care organizations in Medicare, and they looked at the same kind of issues, shared Medicare savings. And uh, after looking over 220 ACOs, entering the program between 2012 and 2013, they came back with the same conclusion that there was not an increase in either the quality of care or the cost. Now, 
I mean, this is a, a damper, I would think, and maybe you're doing something different. Maybe, are you familiar with either of those articles? <laughs> yes, so um, that's a different. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to answer it sideways, if that's okay. Well, this far, how side? How much side? <laughs> okay, the dir direct answer to one of your questions is that in future years, HMSA is intending to change the per member per month based on your risk. So if you take care of complex patients, your per member per month will be higher than if you don't. So that's a direct that's answer a to one of them. Right. Future but the other one, I, I think everything you've said is obviously valid. I mean, who's going to argue that those studies in, in the New England Journal of Medicine is not uh, scientifically sound? Nobody's going to argue with that. But the interesting thing is for many of us, this payment transformation change is not about the money or the quality. It's about our own practice quality of life. And the fact that we can't get anybody to come and succeed us in our practice or to get anyone to come and uh, be Dr. Shirasu's succession plan or Dr. Ishioka's succession plan. We can't get anybody. And part of the reason is, is that nobody likes the practice that we've got. And so we, be, and the other thing to, to remember is that this payment model, the one, no, I'm sorry, not this payment model, the payment model I showed you is gotta be an intermediate step. It is not the final payment model. And I think what, what uh, Kevin is sharing is another generation closer to being the correct payment model. Because at least it's based on some standard. Right? So we, I, those of us who are in the pilot, we don't believe that, that this is the end game, nor do we like the game we're playing. But we believe that there is an end game that's better than the one we're playing. And we need to get there. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen in steps, in stages, in, in a transformation, probably past when I retire, I'm guessing. So I, I don't disagree with the evidence because I, I know what the evidence says. But I think that we, we have to think about it slightly differently because that's not necessarily Necessarily, the goal. Those the models that you're talking about was actually ACO models, right? Is that the yeah? So we're not an ACO. We we haven't actually no, even we, touched. Yeah, there was one that was an ACO, and the other was um, more or less a capitated program, I guess you call it. Yeah, I wasn't aware that actually there were, were models uh, using a mean, global. Don't yeah. check this one set for you. Uh, the first one. It was called a Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative. Evaluating a model, uh, I'll give you a direct quote from Kimball. Um, it was evaluating a model that's quite similar to what HMSA is implementing here in Hawaii. After two years, the practice has received a median of 115,000 per clinician in care management fees to implement the model, including integrating care managers in the practice, focusing on high risk, high utilizing patients, and this this is what was analyzed. So, in other words, you know, you, you can't say it's exactly like what HMSA. Yeah, they're getting, they're getting paid on a but higher. It, but according to what he understood about the HMSA model, and according to what he understood about the model that was in the New England Journal, it was basically the same. So um, I think that in that model, the thing again is the premise, the original premise now mm -hmm. by administrators is that doctors are doing too much for volume to get more money. And this was, uh, um, unfortunately, our president's point of view. I know from direct quotes that I heard from him. And, and actually, uh, I'm, a, I'm sorry to say, AMA bought into that. And, and so when Congress went with MACRA and developed it, they assumed that that was true. But you know, the problem is, I, I don't know how somebody in your group will actually be compensated for being extra good, let's put it that way, in your group. Because, it, you know, in a sense, he's got his payment. If he meets a certain goal and he has an average, less than average uh, cost for the patient, he gets a bonus. No, no. He goes out beyond that, he doesn't get the bonus. So it's kind of like, it's a flattening of the incentive, let's put it that way, the, um, to do more work. The, um, 
current quality program is still in existence and has been even before the change in payment. So actually the doctors have been receiving, including myself, mm-hmm. bonuses for the quality scores that we get and that oh, still will be that. there. Yeah. yeah, so it's still in effect. So yeah, if you do or higher quality mm-hmm. care, you still be eligible for the same pay for quality bonuses on top of your monthly global payment. Right. So that program doesn't go away. In terms of the risk adjustment, though, our model did include a risk adjustment score um, based on the severity of the patient's illness. So in HMSA, they have a, a risk score that's assigned to every patient currently, and it's called an ERG number. So we took that ERG number and we watered it down only because we weren't sure how much it affected. But so our um, our payment model does account for the risk score, so it does right now. But we feel that it should probably be expanded because by the time you actually factor that in, the differences in the payment didn't change that much. Right. But it, it is risk adjusted currently. Yeah. So like, if you had high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, actually theoretically, your your payment would go up. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Taking care of that patient. Yes, so it is now. And to answer your question about the sicker patients, you know, if you need to see the patient every day, you, you do it. I don't think about if I'm going to get paid or not because I'm going to get paid for this group of patients mm-hmm. every month. So some patients require one visit, some every four months, some every six months, yet others require visits every week. And so I don't really think about that. I don't have to worry about that anymore because I just see them because they need to be seen rather than worrying if I'm going to get paid enough you know, for that. Well, okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question, two questions. Um, this new program, HMSA says they're going to be offering you much more services to manage your office better, like your ecosystem and your other support services. I'm wondering if you could help us with what HMSA is offering in terms of outside of your office services. And the second is, HMSA says that data will be flowing to you so you can manage it appropriately. Can you describe how well data has been managed back to you so you can actually use it? Because in the past, at least, data has been inaccurate and late, and so not usable. So two questions. What is HMSA doing to support you? And then what how's the data for you? I think that's both of them. So um, the first question, um, we've had the same challenges, you know. Um, with Healthways, you know, in the beginning, we did not have much support in terms of things outside of our usual office. So we don't have that yet. It's in being in developed right now. So we were without that. Um, in here, we've spent some of our monies that the organization has to work on a project called Best Heart Care. We're working on our CHF patients. And so we've had to uh, pay for um, a nurse coordinator that will go out to the home. And so it is costly, but we want to see how much impact that will do on our uh, patients as well as we do submissions. So it's actually things that we've been piloting but not getting paid for fully at this time. One of our... Um, one of the parts of our contract that we are currently in, um, called Learning Health Homes, actually piloted a database system um, that called Ideas. That actually was a uh, it's an information platform that we can analyze our patients. Um, and it's a very good system. Actually, it's better than what we actually know how to use it right now because there's so much data. We could actually look into each each doctor's ER visits, the frequency of you know how we see them. Um, it, and I think we haven't really grasped the full utilization of that yet, but the, the current program that we have access to allows us to do that. Um, we've compared doctor to doctor on, on those kind of issues, ER visits and things like that, uh, hospital um, readmissions. Um, we're looking at pharmaceutical costs right now, how we manage diabetics. Um, I know Coziva has been there, and we haven't used sure metrics ourselves because we have this other data platform, so I can't speak to how usable the sure metrics is. Yeah, so, you know, um, <clears throat> our, our physician organization has sort of had a different history with Healthways. We actually got along with them to some extent. And so um, we, we, have, and we have had a relationship with Healthways in terms of getting resources out of them. And I can, I can speak somewhat to HMSA's um, resources that they're planning to put out because I've had some 
ability to give input into that program. So I'll tell you that what's being planned is that those resources are going to come through your physician organization because it's just an economy of scale thing, right? You can't give a social worker to everybody. But at the PO level, you can assign X number of social workers per X number of docs or X number of covered lives. And so that's the, the plan is to create, create these teams called post teams, PO support teams. And each PO will get an equivalent amount to other POs based on their number of physicians that they have in their PO and the lives they get covered. And so there will be resources, but the resources will be doled out through the physician organization, not directly to the uh, physicians. Um, the second question about Coziva, um, we all hate it, and we're, we're really working hard to get them to fix it. And Surematrics is a joke right now, really. So we're, we're, we're really trying hard to get them to fix it so that we can get data that means something. Um, because as you said, how are you going to manage your population without it? Yeah, actually I need to say, you know, recently with, with um, some of the healthways workers in Hilo, we actually had a big change in, in terms of them actually going out and seeing the patients in their homes and coming in with the visits with me and we're helping to engage them better. So it's been positive. I was telling Carol about that, that I think there definitely is a change and we look forward to seeing what the new team will be like. We haven't experienced yet, but the, the <coughs> current employees with Healthways of Hilo, one of them or two of them that I've worked with, they actually have been great. They're going out to my sicker patients and, and actually doing real care coordination face-to-face -face kind of stuff. So Mike, you're one of the four pilots. Have all <coughs> four of you been talking together, coming up with similar responses, or how, how were they there? Yes, so um, we get together once a month with HMSA and the UPenn um, consultants, uh, and we are able to really tell them what we don't like and what we do like, and they've been very responsive in fixing some of the things that really doesn't work, and we're anticipating that um, they're going to learn some more as we get through this year, as we are going to learn some more. And I think by the time we roll it, they roll it out to the general population of patient, uh, physicians, it's going to be slightly better, hopefully a lot better. Uh, I have a question. Earlier you showed a cartoon about the rat and the hamster wheel and how we're all going to get out of that the wheel. And this question is for both of you. but. Uh, how many patients are you seeing now on every day compared to what you were seeing, say, three years ago? That's your question. Then for Mike, because you had a short time. Yeah, so before, you know, I might see like 35 patients because with all the work-ins. Now I'm probably averaging 25 to 30, but they're not waiting as long. <laughs> you know, um, I have a big panel practice, you know, so um, so I, I, I spend, you know, 20, 30 minutes sometimes with my, my um, physicists that are every four months or six months, but uh, it's, the schedule is not crazy like it used to be, so I'm not getting on my staff or getting all upset because I'm, you know, half an hour late. I, I tend to be I try to get that within that 15 minute thing. They don't wait more than 15 minutes. So and my schedule is a lot more predictable. The work is working in, at the time slot, so they're not expecting, you know, um, sometimes uh, in, in the afternoons when there's a, a complex work in, um, they're not as upset because we got them in today because they wanted to come in today. So there's not as much, uh, you know, people going to urgent care or to the ER, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I currently see about 25 to 30. And my plan is, based on what I told you, is that this is not a simple thing of going from seeing patients four times a year to seeing them once. It's just, that's not a simple thing. And if you decrease your number of visits, you're gonna decrease your co-payments, you're gonna have a hard time getting your quality numbers up unless you've created infrastructure to do that between visits. So this, to me, is a gradual thing. And my goal to the end of this year is to reduce my visits by 25% and allow new patients into the panel. Because if you're not allowing new patients to the panel, there's, you know, there's no pressure to reduce your visits, right? So the reducing visits to me means doing it gradually so it doesn't hurt my bottom line and doing it in a way that allows me to bring in new patients. And so my numbers haven't changed yet. I just have one uh, practical question. Uh, what was have you analyzed the increase in cost for your staff, in other words, cost for your practice, your staff, as now compared to, say, three years ago, as far as salaries and insurance coverage? In other words, 
what was the difference in the actual cost of, of transition to a different method with more staff, less staff, more highly paid staff? What, what was the difference? For me, uh, my overhead still is about 60%. And it kind of remained the same because my income went up and I had one more staff member come on. So it didn't change too much. Yeah, you know what, I, 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 can, I can answer that one kind of directly. So in the old payment, mo the old new payment model where we were getting a PCMH care, court, care management fee at the front end and, and um, quality measure money at the back end, we decided to invest about 15000 a year per doc on the front end, thinking that we would get back more than 15000 at the end of the year on the back end. And it actually turned out that for the 15000 each that we, we invested in care coordinators on the front end, we made $45,000 each in quality money at the back end. Mm -hmm. So it actually turned out to be a money-making project, this, this small transformation that we created. So uh, is that going to get better going forward? I actually think it might. Especially if HS, HSA actually puts in the resources to help us that they are saying they're going to. Since you've been in this for three years, premiums for HMSA go up like 7 to 10% a year. Does your PFPM go up about 7 to 10% a year to reflect their increases in expenses? Or are we just giving more shared administrators but trying to provide higher level care while they take a larger mm -hmm. chunk of the pie? It's hard to really compare because we, we changed uh, the right last year we changed and this current uh, payment structure on this small office too is higher uh, than it was previously probably by more than the inflationary um, index um, especially with the extra bonuses and everything it seems like I'm bringing more money just, so um, so it's been so I guess the plain devil's that get to that I mean, they guarantee that you're going to remain income neutral, at least for the first year or two. What is the guarantee that you're going to maintain that going forward, or are they going to start cutting your PNPN as we all get supposedly more efficient? We, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen in year two for the state, you know, the whole state. I know for us, um, um, when we negotiated model office two, um, uh, two doctors out of the 13 actually had a drop in their pain, but they felt it still was worth it for them to continue with the payment model, so they didn't opt out. Yes? I had a question on the, on the systems. Mike, did I, did I understand you correctly that within the physician organizations, individual physicians are compared to the, the cohorts within the organization? No. You're talking about total cost of care? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so it's not that the individual physicians are compared to each other in the, in the physician organization. It's the physician organization is eligible for a total cost of care incentive based on the performance of their own PO, meaning that if your PO did, we did better than last year, on total cost of care, you'd, you'd get a share of that savings. Okay, so then my question is for, when this goes statewide, for those physicians who are solo practitioners, are they gonna need to affiliate with a physician organization? And if so, is that gonna need to be one that's currently in place, or is there gonna be the ability to form their own physician organization? Yeah, so you, you won't be able to participate in payment transformation unless you're a member of a physician organization. I'm sure that there's room for new organizations to be formed, but there's, um, it's possible, for sure. Um, there was another question that I was going to answer for you. Oh, they pay per member per month. So what we were told on the per member per month is that over years, they're planning to get the per member per month statewide to become one by creating these levels of PMPMs and then moving people toward, toward the correct PMPM. Uh, we, we will be lucky if that correct PMPM is MGMA standard, but um, they are planning to make that a much fairer PMPM. Mike, uh, your panel is just like um, 1,700? Um, my panel is about 1,200. 1,200. And is your PMPM like $23? Uh, mine is 17. 17. I find
find it very interesting when you say that you need to increase the panel and still your work goes down. Because you're gonna you're gonna have to learn how to deal take care of your population. I've been doing it for forty years <laughs> and people just get sick. And then you gotta be seen, right? It's like it's almost like asking me to feed five thousand people with five loaves of bread. <laughs> That's called a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> or walk on water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you do get the ability to see those sick patients. I mean, and probably better than it was before. You're, so your schedule, you're probably seeing a lot, a lot of people every day. Yeah. So if if your schedule is already full, you got ten more people who want to come in. You squeeze those ten patients in. If they're sick or injured, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. So do you have room usually to do that in your schedule right now? You make room. Yeah. Right. So you stay later or stuff like that. Right. Because if you if your schedule wasn't full, then you won't make as much money that day. Right? I mean, your or your, is your schedule always full like for months on end? Well, it depends upon the time of the year. Yeah. But statistically, so many people... I'm a pediatrician. Uh -huh. So many people are going to get sick that day and so yeah. many people are going to get injured. No matter what you try to do. And before, if you had a less than full schedule and you had openings before you started that day, would you be nervous that you weren't going to earn your income that day? If you didn't have a full no. schedule, you didn't worry then. No, because you average it up for the year. Yeah. There's slow times, there are busy times. Okay. Yeah, so like for us right now, you know, you don't see a decrease in income if you don't fill your schedule up, you know, ahead of time. Like for us, a lot of it is, you know, health preventative, but also periodic care. And if all your schedule is filled with periodic care patients, the hypertensives, the diabetics that come in, then you need to see 10 more. It's probably hard, I don't know about you, but for me, I, I used to run behind and get, patients get upset and I get upset because I don't like to run behind but it's, it's hard to squeeze in patients when there's no room and they used to put people in in the beginning of the day and I'm already behind and I get upset because I'm you know an hour behind for the rest of the day because they put a very ill acute work in so we have room for those patients uh, you know to the day that we leave open until that day so they don't get filled so they make sure that it's not squeezing in more patients into an already full schedule. I can kind of see a potential here for going from fee for service, trying to squeeze in as many patients as possible in a day, to uh, trying to scramble for patients on your panel and trying to build up your panel as big as you can handle it. So it's going to be a grab for patients rather than a grab for visits. Yeah, that's going to happen over time, though. That's not going to be on day one. Everybody is going to try to grab everybody else's patients. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I think what Frank was driving at is, I think pediatrics is different from internal medicine and family practice. Oh, mm -hmm. So you have pediatricians in EI. How have they viewed your model, and why are they not involved in your model? The main hesitation with our pediatricians was the immunizations. At that time, they were going to include the immunizations as part of the global payment, and it wasn't worked out. So they just decided to not do it. But now that it's a carve-out, you know, they're definitely um, going to be part of next year's transition. Well, they want to have a choice. But, but, um, no, they want to be part of our model office, too, also. With, with our, yeah. The total PMDM is way higher than whatever I don't know if it's way higher. I, I saw. It is if your PFPM does not include the PCA payment, which is a separate payment, then you're automatically getting another $3 for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting a foot of 26 PFPM. When they had a graph at one of the meetings, I was looking at the different bands, and it varied a lot. I was I was shocked that some people was it as high as 120. Yeah, it was. There was like a four and a half fold difference between the lowest and the highest. I'm not sure the lowest one was, but ten, twelve dollars. Yeah, twelve dollars. So twelve and up to what one twenty. Some doctors are getting paid wow. the equivalent of one hundred twenty dollars PMPM right now, and they're they're not going to get any. Actually, they're going to get paid that same amount in the transition for the first year. 
Okay. But, yes. Question. In your discussions with uh, HMSA, I thought you mentioned you worked with the NGMA, the NGMA benchmark. Yeah. Our current model is based on on the 50 percentile MGMA for family medicine, internal medicine, a national, a national. What is that number? Oh, okay. And it went up this year, so because of you know the MGMA went up, so our oh to answer that question, that's right, our income did go up because the uh, MGMA went, went up. I think it's two. I'm not sure. Two something. You took it on the salary. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a national number. That's kind of what a lot of people use to hire, and so we use that as the base. And then we there's a calculation based on overhead expenses and um, a number of different things, including risk score. And then we came up with this um, PNPN number, which is what we're using. I, I can tell you, we use MGMA data to hire a tripler, and an intern is three hundred fifty thousand a year. I think what was under the question is trying to understand whether or not there's any looking at any benchmarking data about PMPMs and when that's come up in the discussion. You mean nationally? You know, I'm not aware that there's other areas in the country that are on PMPM. When I asked um, some of the University of Pennsylvania consultants on one meeting, I said, you guys must be excited about this. I mean, coming over to help, I said, how many groups are you working with that are doing this? And they said, nobody. So, <laughs> so it's actually new. This is not right. Am I wrong? There's not, nobody else in the country right now is getting paid PNPN. There are yeah. a couple of other groups that are. I think in the, the on the mainland? different though. Yeah. So, in all the different models take into consideration different components. Mm -hmm. So it's not really an apples apples comparison for, mm -hmm. for benchmarking. And we do have, you know, experiences back when capitation, you know, but that's way different. And we had no, at that time, we had no information, no data. And most of the groups who took risk got way more risk. We're not in any risk sharing model right now. We're basically getting paid for our primary care services. We're not getting, we're not at risk for anything, actually. There's no downside risk. Yes. So there's a number of specialists <laughs> in the audience, too, has maybe the HMSI guys say What's the plan for? Mm. I know Mark wrote a letter recently. I was reading it, and I mean they are going to look at everyone else, and in some way or form. I don't know what the model will be or what's proposed. Do you know? Yeah, we don't have any other details yet. But you know, we started with primary care, and this year we're starting, <coughs> excuse me, to look at specialty and uh, inpatient uh, facility uh, care at the same time. So we're we're just starting the preliminary conversations. We're probably at the place we were with primary care um, a year and a half ago, and that's where we're starting right now. So we're at can't expect anything for us. Uh, no, we're hoping we have at least a basis for a model sometime in 2017 um, to maybe start piloting. Um, but yeah, it's just real preliminary to even talk about any of the details at this point. Yeah, I suspect that HMSC is going to do the same thing for the specialists that they did for primary care, which is they're going to collect groups of specialists together for um, input, and they're going to come up with a model that will be partially vetted by the specialists before they create a pilot with interested specialists and then moving on to the general public. I think that's probably what they're going to do. Uh, what do you anticipate for the management of Medicare and Medicaid? <coughs> we will obviously be a lower reimbursement level. I mean, is this model that you're having now that you say works pretty well for both of you, what's going to be the impact? Are you going to just continually not get involved with Medicare and Medicaid? You're going to eliminate them from your practice altogether or what? Yeah, so Medicare is a different ball of wax, right? So yeah. what we know current, what we know as of today is that the legislation is going to cause physicians in 2019 to choose between two paths. One, which is fee-for-service that's either discounted or or energized by a quality um, quality money or become part of a, of what essentially is an accountable care organization or a risk bearing arrangement or a PCMH like um, PCMH certified uh, program that's basically our choice in 2019 and they're going to start collecting our data in 2017 um, and Really, they want us to move to the point where everybody is on some kind of global payment. But at the start, probably 95% of us 
are going to be in this program called, I don't know, it's called MIPS, I forget what it stands for, but it's really awful. And so they have it set up so that you're going to want to move to some um, risk-bearing arrangement. Otherwise, you're going to have a more, you're going to have a gradually declining reimbursement over years. That's what's going to happen in the MIPS, the MIPS choice. Yeah. So it's really no choice. <laughs> All the time, a real no choice, unless there's pushback from physicians and physicians' organizations. And um, this is why representation in the county, the health, state society, and AMA are so important. And I don't know how many here are members, but to those of you that aren't, just think of it this way. The HMA and county is the Marines, but we need the Army. So if you're not a member, better get in because we got to have a voice in this whole deal or else we're going to be run over. You know, there's a community in uh, Grand, Grand Junction, Colorado. They've, you know, worked in a setting. They're kind of like, uh, maybe like a hero like setting, kind of a close. But they've been actually, interestingly, their doctors got together and they actually came up with a blended single payment that the insurers agreed upon, probably local Blue Cross Blue Shield, where their doctors get paid the same rate for Medicare, commercial, Live or Medicaid, one rate, and they've been doing this for quite a while now. They've been known to have very high quality. This Grand Junction, Colorado, and so they've been kind of a model that we've been looking at. You know, in terms of, you know, what what they can do in a community like that. So for we've had them actually come down and speak to us um, in our annual um, symposium every year. But interesting in that way, you think about access. If you're getting the same payment for Medicaid versus Medicare versus commercial, hey. Then and the Medicaid patients have good access now, which will help a lot. I think that's a good, if, if we can work out the rate to be equitable and, and definitely beneficial, it will increase the access for Medicaid patients right now, which, you know, unfortunately, they probably have a hard time you know, getting into. So I don't know if that's something down the road. I know when we've had a few discussions with, with Paul about, because um, our contract is strictly with commercialized, not unlike the, um, the share. So maybe something like that, you know, might come out of Yes. You might not know this information, but I bet HMSA does. Has anybody looked at um, ER utilization and the cost of hospitalizations with your group compared to non? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with our information system, we were able to analyze that. Initially, the data they gave us um, was that our utilization was higher. Actually, we looked through our information system and we calculated, and when we looked at the data, actually it was lower. Because access, you know, and doctors closing early and leaving because they're getting paid and going on vacations for one month at a time is a concern. So part of our engagement, you know, measures with this book was to look at ER utilization, that it would be no higher than the state average. So that was one of our measures that we're able to continue our program. We had to make sure that we weren't dumping patients or not having them come in for visits. But it, it continued to be, you know, the ER, you know, it's an area where I think there's, uh, we got to do a lot of work because, man, somebody goes in there and boom, they get every every picture they want taken. And, and, and if they can't get their approval for the MRI, they're going to go to the ER and stuff like that, which is going to increase the cost of care. So I don't know the answer to that one, um, but we, we're starting some conversations with the ER docs in Hilo, and we have a meeting coming up because some of my good colleagues, the radiologists, they're getting tired of reading all these films. It's useless. I mean, running scans for dizziness, you know, and MRAs, MRIs, and CTs of the neck. And, and so that is an area that maybe we can perhaps get a little bit more clarity and efficiency there. But it's a big well, concern. Not only that, but like um, I read somewhere that one heart failure hospitalization is like $35,000. So you save one of those and you, you've got your capitation for the year practically yeah. for that. Yeah, so trying to make a dent, uh, our challenge is, you know, trying to get adequate personnel involved in this. And so we hope when we, when we do meet with our new, um, with our post um, colleagues that we can get some help because I think if we can show uh, a win in that area, at least it'll prove that the care coordination does really work, you know. Well, uh, ultimately, you know, I, I, I admire the effort. Let me put it that way. You guys are out on the front doing something that's new. But the problem that I see in terms of the whole global effect is that 
We don't have control of pharmaceutical costs that are going through the roof, even generic drugs. My patients are stunned by the fact that I tell them, you know, oh, you can get a generic, and then suddenly this price is way up here, like $125 for a drop of eye drops. Okay. We don't have that under control, and we don't have tort reform under control, which was why the ERs are doing all these tests. Oh, yeah. Tests. I totally agree. You, you will have a never, you know, the doctor's fees and services are about 10 to 17 percent of the total health care costs. So we're being targeted by administration and government and everything else, but the other 87 percent <coughs> is left out in the never, never land and not addressed. I think, you know. So we got to do something about that because if you really want cost savings, you got to work on what really costs. Exactly. And I think this whole, I think the whole goal is to get the doctors to communicate better with each other. If we start working with each other, talking to each other, there could be a lot more that we can do as a group of doctors that are actually at the same thinking, you know, align the incentives and, you know, like, like an integrated system, you know, perhaps get the efficiencies there and, and everyone will benefit from that, you know, um, working together. It's hard. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, a lot of the things that you mentioned in terms of changing their practices, yeah. you've actually been doing that on the PCMH and the people service. So I, I'm having difficulty linking the payment model to the actual transformation, because almost everything you listed there, we're actually engaged in that already, doing team models, doing pre-visit planning That's great. in a fee-for-service model. So, I mean, Mike, maybe you can help with that. I, I don't see that payment itself initiating leading to that change, because we've done that under the fee-for-service model. That's great. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, when we first started, exactly, we kind of started in that realm. But you know, it's um, not everybody's doing that. I think very few. So you guys are far ahead. I'm, I'm just wondering how the payment model then, you know, it doesn't seem that that's correct for the board. I, I would say th this is my take on it. I I think number one is that we're we're always focused on the cost because we've been told that that's that's our fault and so forth and on and so on and obviously it's not and we don't we represent eight percent of the total cost and so it's not it's not really the issue. For me, the issue is that I know that if I do good work and I do take care of patients excellently, the cost of the care is going to go down. So my focus is on the on the doing good care. And I believe that doing good care isn't all about the doctor. I mean, when you look at what's, what's the reason why people have poor health outcomes, well, we represent 8% of, uh, 10% of that. It's, it's their, own, their, their own behaviors that represent 50% of it. And there's another 15% that's probably environmental, another 20% that's genetic. But if we're, so if we're going to actually tackle health outcomes, it's going to take more than doctor, more than primary care physicians. It's actually going to take a team. It's going to take health coaches or, or health psychologists or dietitians or CDEs, right? So in order to in order to be able to do that, or it might even it it might even take different kinds of visits. Like for example, if you get a group of diabetics together in the same room, all experiencing the same disease, couldn't they learn from each other? And couldn't you bring enough of those diabetics together with the right resources so that you could teach all of them all at once? And we would get paid for that in the new system because we're getting their PMPM. We're not doing that work ourselves, but we're getting credit for it. And financially, we won't be suffering for the fact that we're seeing patients less because other people are helping us take care of them. And that's the reason why the payment model now has to move for us to move from where we are in PCMH, like, like you are, to move from that to another form of PCMH much closer to what Kevin and guys are experiencing out in Hilo. I think they're doing much more than what we're doing. And part of it is, is they're enabled by the fact that they don't have to churn visits to get their business. Who determines the level of quality that you have provided? Is that determined by doctors or is that determined by somebody else? And what I'm asking around by in a sideways fashion is with the changes with the pilot project. Are you feeling uh, that you are the boss or that you are in control of your practice and you can provide the kind of care that you want to provide and you are deciding what that quality of care dynamic is and in other words, so you can measure that quality in some way else? 
Um, you know, before, <clears throat> before we started in PCMH, I would say that all I would do is go to meetings where somebody would tell me that my uh, mammogram rate was much lower than the, the network average and you, why aren't you doing something about that Nagoshi? And what about your colonoscopy? How come you have only 20% colonoscopies, right? And, and I always thought, well, that's, that's something that I, I learned in training I'm supposed to do, but I just never seem to get to it. Well, now my, my um, quality numbers are 90, 90th percentile across the board. And you know what? I don't do any of it. It's my, it's my care coordinator and my primary and my helper that do all of that for me. So before I even see the patient, I already know that I've done all of those things that before it was impossible for me to get done. So yeah, I feel like I'm more in control of my practice and I feel like I'm providing better care than I did before and I feel like I'm doing it without having to sweat it like I did before. And I, I, I'm guessing that... Yeah, definitely. You know, I was one before PCMH came around that it was it was too overwhelming to just survive the day practicing that that it wasn't a priority. But incentivized by the PCMH and the quality bonuses, it, it is a priority. And yeah, um, our quality scores are higher because we do put emphasis on it. My staff helped me, and it's, it's been good to talk about. You know, it's kind of a. a other things in terms of lifestyle. So IPA had a project earlier this year, or last year, that we wanted to see if we could, um, within the offices, come up with programs to help our patients with our BMI, lowering our BMI. So uh, our office decided to do a, a project with um, 15 of our patients that um, we wanted to lower their BMI a whole class, a uh, whole level down. And we, I, we weren't successful in actually lowering it that much. But um, so what happened in, in our, in, in, everyone had a chance to do whatever they felt was appropriate. So we actually engaged in, in, in an exercise program with a local fitness program. And we had um, dietitians come in and we met over about nine months uh, with this group of um, 15 people. And all of the patients, um, they lost weight, they're enjoying it. In fact, um, the exercise component of it was through the, an organization called Hilo Health Cooperative, which is like this thing called CrossFit. I didn't know what that was until I started, but that was a year and a half ago, and so I go like three or four days a week now. I lost about 15 pounds, and my HDL went up by 40 points. But you know, it was surprised me too, because I never used to exercise that much. And But my, all this group that we started with, they're still in it, because I go there and exercise with them, and um, the, their BMIs went down. In fact, one, one judge, a local judge, he lost 50 pounds. I got him off most of his meds. Uh, he was diabetic, hypertensive, typical metabolic syndrome. And like everybody's looking at him and says, so it's kind of exciting. And this was part of our, some of our projects that we had as a part of Learning Health Home was to engage with the patients a little bit closer. So we have different things going on throughout the year. But one of them that was helpful for myself and my health was this lowering the BMI and to help with exercising. So kind of a neat thing. And I wouldn't have ever continued anything this long before I always quit after two weeks, you know, my New Year's resolution exercise. And, but um, the program's been good and the patients been good. We, in, in this co-op now that we've engaged, we have two study groups going out, each 30 patients from different practices, and and um, the attendance has been somewhere around 84 to 90 percentile with this cohort now three months into that, simply to lower their blood pressure, cholesterol, and, and lipid numbers. So it would be safe to say both of you feel like your professional satisfaction with your pilots has improved? Yeah, no one uh, in our pilot would opt out of it. And we, they've had the opportunity to do that. Take one more question. Yeah, anybody else? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.